right then. Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to the Gallagher College of Engineering's Graduate Student Community Seminar Series for Fall 2023. Um, as a reminder, this is your GSC leadership team this year. Uh, Roshan and I are co-chairs. Uh, our publicity team consists of Andrew and Avinash, who do a fantastic job. Uh, we have a very large support team with Anirvan Swapnu, Mayank, Mohammed, Latif, uh, Fulani, Nuri, and Suraj, Siavas, and Lewis. Um, and then, of course, our faculty mentor, Farouk Bistri. Uh, if you'd be interested in joining the uh, graduate student community, we have regular meetings at 5.15 on Wednesdays over Zoom. Uh, please email either Roshan and I, and we can send you the link to that meeting. Uh, we do set the time uh, as to the schedule of the members. So if that doesn't work for you, you can just let us know and we'll try to see what time works best for everybody. Um, if you'd like to join us on Engage, uh, just so that we have member uh, metrics and we can send more information to you guys, uh, this is our QR code. Uh, feel free to scan that. Um, you can also message us as well. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn page uh, if you guys want to kind of add that to your connections. Um, and a Facebook page where we record all of our events and post pictures and uh, let you guys know anything that has happened or is coming up. And then, of course, if you guys, for whatever reason, cannot make it to a talk or you have to dip out of a lecture early, we do record almost all of our lectures and upload them to the YouTube page. Uh, and this is a QR code for that. Uh, feel free to join us on that one. Um, if you are a graduate student, um, at OB, we actually have a teen room available uh, with couches, whiteboards, coffee pot, just the place you guys can kind of hang out. If you would like access to that, please email either Roshan or I, and we can kind of get you set up for that. Um, as a reminder, we have our fall food festival coming up. It was a huge success last year, so we're doing a uh, another one this fall. Uh, please go ahead and RSVP so we can see how many people are interested. Uh, there's going to be lots of food, music, uh, it's just a good place to kind of network. Um, also, after this intro, I'll be sending out an attendance form. Uh, please feel free to fill that out so that we can kind of get good metrics on how many people attend the seminars and what kind of talks bring in more interest and what you guys want to see more of. All right, and without further ado, um, today's speaker is Connor Cheek, uh, who's going to be giving a talk on brain imaging genetic analysis of academic achievement skills using the elastic net. Uh, he is talking from the University of Houston. All right. Um, Connor, whenever you are ready. Yeah, and I'll try this. Um, now tell me, can you see, which screen do you see? Do you see oh. the screen that has my notes or? We see the full screen, you're good. So you don't see my notes? We do not see your notes. Oh good, I don't want to reveal my secrets. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. I, I know it's considered bad manners to you know, join a Zoom call and not have your video on, at least when you're first meeting people. I apologize for that, but I'm having some uh, technical issues here. Um, but nonetheless, happy to be here. Uh, what I wanted to discuss today is a selection of the research that I did for my dissertation. I recently defended my dissertation in July and then received my PhD in physics from the University of Houston uh, just last month. So I received my PhD in physics and I feel very fresh, it's very freshly minted. The research I'm presenting today is a very interdisciplinary work funded in part by the NIH and done in collaboration with the Child Mind Institute in New York, uh, members from the Landy Lab in the University of Connecticut, and then other members of the Genesis Lab Research Group from the University of Houston, of which I am a part of. So the full scope of what we hoped to accomplish with this line of research is broad. So what I am highlighting today are some contributions I've made as a, um, I guess what I would say is that maybe a data science or machine learning methodologist within my group. Um, and I try to present things in a framework as they are presented to me in case anyone else has any like data science or machine learning interests and would like to know um, like what my thought process was, and maybe you'd like to apply similar thought processes processes to like what you might do if you were encountering new and similar data on your own end. Um, can I 
There we go. The structure of my talk will follow this general trajectory. Uh, Rachel advised me that this is mostly a graduate student group, so I tried to give extra background to the field that I'm working in before I go launching into any specifics. Um, I'll start with some background on brain imaging genetics as a field and talking about what the analytical goals of this discipline is. Um, then I'll also give some background into the Child Mind Institute's Healthy Brain Network project, which is a large scale <laughs> research project aimed at building a biobank of data that's really well suited to answering many of the complex developmental questions that um, my research lab has. I'll introduce the current data release from the Child Mind Institute, highlight some complexities in the multiple data types, and then discuss the development of a pipeline that incorporates just a lot of complex information available. Uh, I'll conclude by discussing the results of the analysis, namely uh, the genes that we identified that seem to correspond well with academic skill outcomes. And then I'll follow with some discussion of the genes and their prior associations with academic skills that we find in the literature. Um, the analysis of the findings is ongoing, but I think that we have some pretty interesting results. And um, I don't know what is considered. Um, if, if people feel comfortable, just feel free to stop me at any point to ask a question or a clarifying question, whatever you may um, have, I'm open to being stopped mid talk to answer anyone's questions. So don't feel shy about doing that. So first, um, to introduce brain imaging genetics, it is a field born from the joint efforts of imaging specialists and geneticists who have a common goal of identifying the genetic variants that are associated with brain measures or brain functions as they relate to brain-based disorders or brain-based traits. Uh, there's a large focus on the use of quantitative brain indicators as endophenotypes, where an endophenotype is an intermediate phenotype that is believed to form a causal link in the chain between an individual's DNA and the outward expression of an individual's trait or disease or disorder. Um, it's expected that, or it's hypothesized that these endophenotypes might be a little more closely related to the root cause of some kind of disease than um, the outwardly expressed behavioral correlates. Prior to brain imaging genetics, um, typical genome-wide association studies would try to directly link the ends of this chain. They would try to directly link an individual's genes to uh, the diagnosed syndrome that they might have or the traits that they might express. Um, but over the years, the past few decades of genome-wide association studies, there appears to be a big replicability crisis where it's difficult for, um, like, you know, in one study, someone might identify a selection of genes which might be very strongly associated with a certain trait, but it's difficult to replicate those results in different, you know, new diverse data sets. Um, it's... There are difficulties associated with this because it's, it's expected that these complex traits are likely the result of many individual genetic markers that each have very small to moderate effect sizes, which require very, very large samples, which are difficult to collect. So brain imaging genetics focuses on the use of these brain or focuses on brain based traits and then tries to incorporate neuroimaging indicators into their models in order to improve power. So a typical um, brain imaging genetic data set will consist of three parts. First, uh, there is some component that characterizes the individual's genome. This uh, could be, for example, a microarray panel that shows individual genetic polymorphisms. Uh, the second component are, is some indicator of brain structure or brain function. Uh, common ones are um, MRI, be it structural MRI or functional MRI, or maybe even um, EEG. Just some characterization of individual brain structure or function. And then finally, there's uh, some component that represents an individual behavioral trait to be modeled. So this could be a continuous outcome, like trying to... Um, model the um, individual like academic assessments, for example, or maybe you're trying to model clinical diagnostic status. 
But regardless of the components that represent these three pieces of brain imaging genetic data, there appears to be a common analytical strategy in which first people will identify these imaging endophenotypes that represent a given behavioral trait. I tried to illustrate this graphically on the top right of the screen uh, for an example behavioral trait, um, say math performance. Um, some form of identifying the brain, like the regions of the brain, which are most associated with the trait, for example, math performance are selected as endophenotypes. Um, in practice, this tends to be done based on theory. Like people will look in the literature to see like in the past what brain image, like what brain regions are most associated with certain outcomes. But, you know, less common, we'll see that there are some data driven approaches to identifying these endophenotypes. Regardless, once the endophenotypes have been selected, then individuals try to examine the relationship between these imaging endophenotypes and individual genotypes. Here shown in the bottom right of the screen in this little graphic representation, um, the specific endophenotypes selected in step one are then uh, tested for association with the whole genome. And then hopefully individual pieces of the genome are identified as strongly associated and then uh, you identify genes that are associated with a given trait via those imaging endophenotypes. Now, in the literature, we found that there tend to be three general classes of approach people use to determine these relationships between genes and endophenotypes. The first class consists of a group of regularized multiple multivariate regression strategies. Um, an image, a, a visual example is shown on the bottom left here, but we also find um, decent use of classical machine learning models like uh, support vector machines, random forests, sort of like your um, usual suspects in terms of like these classical machine learning models where classical machine learning is differentiated from neural network based deep learning approaches. Now we saw it the we are about to publish um, a review of these methods in behavior genetics, and we started writing this piece with the idea of with the goal of identifying which method might be best suited to analyze complicated brain imaging genetic data. And it turns out that this is not a question that we we could really answer based on the literature. We could identify which methods are the most popular, which tend to be the regularized regression approaches. And it appears that these are more popular because it seems that they can handle slightly larger dimensionality. Um, but machine learning and deep learning still are very good candidates. They're just very problem uh, dependent on the problem parameters. Like they tend to be applied more when you have maybe a short list of candidate genetic markers and also a short list of potential endophenotypes. And you want to model ex ex specific relationships between those two. Um, but there is a lot of bias in the literature in that most of the analysis tends to be on Alzheimer's disease, um, mostly because there was really only one publicly available brain imaging genetic data set available in the past 10 years or so that is changing very, very recently. Um, but because there was only the one data set, people are developing models on the same data set. And so it's ultimately unclear which strategy might generalize into a new context. Now, recently, um, the Child Mind Institute, which is a New York City based nonprofit whose goal is to produce services to children who might be struggling with mental health or learning disabilities. Um, the Healthy Brain Network is a research study aimed at collecting a large biobank of cognitive developmental indicators for a projected goal of 10,000 youths from the New York City area. And the breadth of data types that this project is collecting make it very well suited to investigating these various developmental uh, questions, um, like they're collecting academic skill. They're they're collecting indicators of academic skill indicators. Uh, um, assessments. Oh, it seems like someone's getting a knock at the door. Anyway, I'll continue. Um, there are academic skill indicators measured by academic skill assessments. Uh, there are measures of clinical or behavioral slash cognitive um, outcomes based on these assessments. There's multimodal brain imaging captured by 
uh, MRI, both structural MRI, which captures, um, which is capturing uh, individual gray matter components of the brain, and then diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, which focuses on white matter indicators. And then they're also collecting saliva samples from each of these kids, from which DNA is uh, later extracted. So it's very well suited for investigating these complex, or for figuring out what the genetic associations are with these complicated developmental outcomes. But the data collection, the, pre the data collection, the pre-processing, and the quality control um, efforts in um, a collaboration of this size are challenging. And so currently, we only have a fraction of the data and the data types that are available for this analysis. Namely, we have um, academic skill assessments, we have brain imaging indicators measured by white and gray matter, and then we have the saliva samples for every individual that passes the relevant QC. Now, I'll try to give you a little more background into each of the data types that we have, just so that you can understand a little more of the complexity of the data. So the academic assessments for each child come from three main assessments. The first is called the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, or the CTOP. As the name suggests, this test is chiefly concerned with characterizing or measuring an individual's ability to um, or phonological processing ability, which is the ability to break apart and manipulate the individual phonemes or the individual sounds which comprise a single word. And this consists of four tasks, or five tasks, excuse me. There's elision, which measures the individual or the child's ability to remove segments of spoken words in order to form new ones. So, for example, the administrator could tell the child to say cowboy without saying cow, and the correct answer would then be boy. Uh, the blending words task measures the child's ability to synthesize sounds to form words. So being presented with the individual sounds, k, a, t, and then being able to form the word cat from those individual phonemes. Uh, Non-word repetition, which measures the child's ability to repeat nonsense words accurately, where a nonsense word is a word that meets all the grammatical rules of whichever language is being tested, but has no meaning. So the prompt could be repeat the word squishy, or squishy is the nonsense word as it sounds like it could be a real word in English, but it really has no meaning. And then finally, there are two tests, rapid letter naming and rapid digit naming, both which are uh, measuring a child's ability to rapidly identify these symbols, these numbers and these letters, based on quick visual cues. This targets a little more of the uh, processing speed. But aside from the CTOP, we have the test of word reading efficiency. This test is um, predominantly focused on reading ability and consists of two tasks, which are timed. So there is an efficiency aspect to this. The sight word efficiency test measures the child's ability to identify sight words in a 45 second period of time, whereas phonemic decoding efficiency measures that child's ability to accurately pronounce nonsense words again in a 45 second period of time. And then finally, there's the Weschler individual achievement test or the Wyatt, which measures um, reading ability, like aspects of math, ability and then aspects of listening and reading comprehension. So there's word reading, measuring the speed and accuracy of their child's ability to um, read single words, uh, spelling, the ability of a kid to spell words spoken out loud, pseudo word reading, which measures the speed and accuracy of the child in decoding a list of these nonsense words, uh, receptive vocabulary, which that the child will be asked to identify objects from a list given verbal cues. In other words, point to the hat, and the child has to point to a picture of a hat. Um, oral discourse comprehension is another listening comprehension task, which measures a child's ability to understand and extract meaning after listening to audio recordings. Um, there are two math problem solving tasks, both which measure uh, math problem solving is more of um, a math reasoning assessment, which requires a child to read a math problem and then like uh, perform some calculations based on this word problem. And then there's a lower level numerical operations test, which is just measuring a child's ability to perform simple pen and paper calculations. 
And then finally, there's a reading comprehension task, which measures the child's ability to understand or extract meaning from written passages. So I put all of this out there to just demonstrate that one, our goal are, is to predict or explain academic skill uh, proficiency using genetic markers and imaging endophenotypes. And in our data set, we have 15 individual tasks that like, are measuring specific aspects of academic skill. And as such, they represent 15 potential outcomes we could be trying to model. But there's a lot of overlap between the, the skills that these tasks are targeting. Um, like they are specific enough that they warranted um, the development of these individual tasks to target these um, sub components of these broader constructs like phonological processing. But it's unclear whether or not, you know, from a biological perspective, the genetic components that are associated with a person's ability to um, decode sight words versus nonsense words, that's unclear. So there's a challenge here to construct meaningful outcome variables. And I'm going to put a pin in this and come back to that later. Because next, I wanted to discuss the two types of imaging indicators that we have as a part of this data set. Um, the first are indicators of white matter brain development, which is considered to be uh, the signal transmission part of the brain. Um, the child would receive a diffusion tensor imaging scan or a DTI scan, which is just a, um, a protocol that is in the MRI scan whenever someone takes um, a structural MRI. Our team in the University of Connecticut would take the image generated from these MRI scans and perform some sophisticated skull stripping, uh, brain normalization, and then map each of these images onto a, um, a neuroanatomical atlas that outlines specific cortical regions of the brain. Our team used the Harvard Oxford Atlas, which outlines 48 separate cortical regions in the white matter tissue of each child. And then from each of these regions, they extract two measures of structural integrity. So at the end of just the white matter um, data processing, for each child, we'll have 96 indicators of their white matter structural integrity. Now, gray matter indicators of brain development. These are considered the signal processing part of the brain. Um, similarly, each child receives this MRI scan. And this MRI scan that targets the gray matter regions of the brain is um, similarly processed by our team in Connecticut. This image is mapped to a different neuroanatomical atlas called the Distro Atlas. There's a, a ripper, or an example of this here on the bottom right of the screen. The Distro Atlas um, outlines 148 to 150 anatomical regions across the left and right hemispheres. And at each region, two volumetric and two morphometric measures are estimated. So there are, for each child, a total of 596 indicators of their gray matter brain development. And then finally, our final piece of the puzzle is the genetic data. So each individual, each study participant from the Healthy Brain Network will provide a saliva, a saliva sample for later DNA extraction. Um, the type of genetic data that we focus on and tends to be, I think, the most focused on in the literature is the single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a variant at a specific single location in the genome. And these are with respect to a reference genome for different um, genetic ancestries. So these, these polymorphisms are mutations that occur naturally through either recombination errors or through um, or through recombinations or through errors during like DNA replication. Oftentimes they're harmless. Most often um, an individual polymorphism, might result in the same biological effect and therefore being meaningless in terms of uh, its association with a given outcome, but sometimes not. It's hypothesized that a lot of um, complicated or complex 
neurodevelopmental traits, like the per a person's ability to read or a person's ability to do math, et cetera, are actually the result of many hundreds of thousands of individual genetic variants, all with small effect sizes, sort of all together resulting in um, some behavioral outcome. So for us, we take the saliva, we isolate it, extract it, and then genotype individual DNA using commercial microarray platforms. Specifically, we use um, the Infinium Core Exome 24 microarray, which has information for over 500,000 specific genomic targets. These are specific sites in an individual's DNA. And we use um, Infinium's proprietary software, Genome Studio, to finish the genotyping and remove these low quality reads, resulting in, for each individual, almost 400,000 total SNPs. So at a glance, I have all of the data types that I just discussed here. And I um, wanted to highlight the complexity of this, because we have all of these different data types, um, a lot of dimensionality for each individual, and then a lot of potential outcomes. In order to adequately process all of this data, what we needed is some sort of efficient pipeline in order to handle all of it in a meaningful um, way. And so that is where the bulk of my research came in, was in the development of an analytical pipeline that takes in these separate behavioral assessments, the imaging indicators, be they gray matter or white matter, and the genotyping data, and run them through a pipeline that first performs, or a three-stage pipeline that first performs um, data wrangling, which is just basic pre-processing steps, uh, data engineering, and then finally data modeling so that we can finally see if there are any associations between an individual's genome and uh, their individual academic traits using these endophenotypes as intermediates. And I'll go through each of these um, steps briefly in the next couple of slides, starting with the data wrangling stage. If you have done any kind of uh, data science or machine learning or any kind of analysis, really, these should be very, very familiar to you. They're uh, just kind of standard when you're doing any kind of data analysis and that we um, removed related samples um, that may confound uh, genetic analysis. We removed quote unquote bad data, or in other words, data that was missing excessively uh, over 20%. Um, when possible, we imputed any remaining data that may have been missing at reasonable values using a multiple imputation procedure. And then we removed individuals who had an IQ below a certain threshold in order to make sure that their performance in these different academic skills was not overly influenced by some sort of like intellectual or developmental disability. Uh, for the non-genetic data, we standardized it all but to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one so that the individual imaging indicators were more directly comparable. And also for both the behavioral and the imaging indicators, we uh, residualized all the data so that we regressed out any potential effect of covariates such as age, sex, um, the type of MRI scanner that was used to collect the MRI data, relevant imaging quality control metrics, etc. Uh, specific to genetic data, we performed some uh, other relevant standard pre-processing steps in that we kept only autosomal chromosomes, which means we removed sex chromosomes from our analysis. Uh, we filtered out any SNPs that had minor allele frequencies less than 0.05, and we performed LD pruning, which removes highly correlated SNPs from the data set. At the end of this stage, we wound up with um, depending on if we're looking at gray matter or white matter, which we analyzed separately, we have between 1,500 to 1,600 participants, um, 596 indicators for gray matter, 96 indicators of white matter, still with 15 individual assessment variables. But we have reduced the dimensionality of our SNPs to be from nearly 400,000 markers down to 90,000. So, woohoo. Uh, the next step is our data engineering step. And there were two goals at this stage. The first goal were to construct academic skill outcomes for analysis that were meaningful. Uh, as you saw before, there were a lot of different behavioral tasks, but they weren't all unique. So the question here was, 
can we combine them in some way to create new outcomes that might be more strongly representative of the individual academic skill they were trying to assess that and you know um if we were to create these new outcomes, they might be stronger and make for better models. And to do this, we came up with two methods of constructing such outcomes. But the second goal was to reduce the dimensionality of the SNP data. So there are too many SNPs. Like we are applying the elastic net, which is um, a regularized regression model. So it's a little more able to handle data that is highly dimensional, but it cannot handle a data set that has over 90,000 features when it only has about 1,500 samples. So we, in goal two, uh, we applied a data-driven method of choosing SNPs that have quote unquote suggested significance to move on to our later modeling stage. Now to talk more about these two goals, um, goal one, we had two outcomes. Well, first, as a reminder, we, had these individual as academic assessments with these numerous individual tasks. We first looked at all of these tasks and wondered, how can we group these in order to form strong academic skill outcomes by uh, correlation groups? So we made this correlation, or we looked at the correlations between each of these individual tasks. You can see this correlation plot on the right side of the screen. Um, any tasks that were grouped with a correlation of 0 0.70 or higher were considered to be were considered to form a group and looking at this correlation plot we found that two correlation groups formed uh, the first being what we called the word level reading correlation group which consists of word level reading tasks a mixture of from a mixture of the Wyatt and the Tower tests and you can see that there's a nice big dark blue uh, square of correlation there on the bottom right of the core plot. But the second correlation group formed was what we called the rapid automatized naming group. And this consists of the two processing speed tasks measured by the CTOP. These are the only two correlation groups that formed. So we treated these groups as outcomes to be modeled by the elastic net. But since the other individual tasks were not highly correlated enough with each other to warrant forming a group, we treated them as individual outcomes. But we weren't really satisfied because I was curious if there were combinations of these individual tasks that might uh, target higher level academic constructs that maybe are not captured by correlation grouping. And to do this, we used principal components analysis. Um, after applying PCA to this battery of academic assessment data, we found that five principal components formed that were significant according to the Kaiser criterion, where the Kaiser criterion says that a principal component that has an eigenvalue larger than one is considered to carry more information than any one of the individual variables that compose that principal component. So based on this criteria, we looked at the first five principal components and then in order to see what higher order academic constructs these principal components might be targeting, we applied a very max rotation to the loadings of each component. And then with the help of some clinical psychologists in my research lab, we looked at the individual, the individual tasks that were sort of um, uh, more strongly representing each principal component to assign some labels to the each principal component. So we came away with these five different labels. Uh, the first principal component being our fundamental reading construct. As it seems, this principal component is composed of not only word level reading ability at tasks, but also broad reading comprehension tasks. Uh, the second principal component is the reading fluency or the reading efficiency component. This task is dominated by the two effic reading efficiency tasks, but also the two um, rapid naming processing speed tasks. The third principal component is fairly straightforward to interpret. It consists largely of the two um, Wyatt math problems, numerical operations and math problem solving. The fourth principal component is the reasoning and comprehension task or construct, and it consists largely of the 
two listening comprehension tasks from the Wyatt and then the reading comprehension task as well. And our final principle component is the phonological reasoning component, which consists of our three uh, tasks from the CTOP, which are more concerned with an individual's ability to manipulate the individual phonemes, which comprise individual words. So our final list of outcomes consists of a mixture of individual tasks, um, all corresponding to a given academic skill. We have two correlation groups, which represent one aspect of a higher order academic skill that isn't al uh, alternatively captured by any individual task. And then we have a group of five principal components, which again capture higher order academic skills that were not captured by the correlation groupings. We use each of these 15 outcomes as <clears throat> something to be modeled by our elastic net using endophenotypes that represent each. Now, the second goal of the data engineering stage is SNP feature selection. So we, like I said earlier, 90,000 SNPs is far too many for our models to deal with. So we needed some way to reduce the total number of genetic markers that's in our data. To do so, we looked back at traditional genome-wide association methods and incorporated what is a typical way of um, finding associations between SNPs and indicators from this field. So what we do and what they do in uh, traditional genome-wide association studies is to perform an individual test of association between each individual SNP and each individual indicator and then they gain some p-value from this test of association, when, which indicates um, the significance of that association. Now, there's a problem with this that is um, a, one of the large problems in genome-wide association studies in general, is that when you adopt this kind of approach, you have multiple tests of the same hypothesis, which yields a very high chance of false positives. Um, and these have to be corrected for using very often very harsh multiple test corrections, which tend to kill any uh, statistical significance that you may have found. Now, if we were to just straight away adopt this traditional method for our data, we would be performing over 5 million statistical tests just for one of our two types of imaging indicators. So. We instead adapted this approach to filter our SNPs according to p-value and not directly select them. So we performed an individual test of association that modeled the development of each individual brain indicator using the individual variant and then included covariates of age, sex, and then the principal components which represent genetic ancestry. There are Manhattan plots for these associations shown on the right, where Manhattan plots are just typical ways of representing the strength of these analysis in genome-wide association studies. The x-axis represents the <clears throat> position of the SNP in the genome ranked or ordered according to the chromosome. So on the far left side of the x-axis, this is the very first SNP on the first chromosome. And then on the far right-hand side of the axis, of the axis is the very last SNP that lies on the 22nd chromosome. The y-axis is the log transformation of the p-value. So a very, very, very high uh, point on this graph would represent a p-value that is very, very, very small and thus deemed to be highly significant. Um, we filtered SNPs according to their p-values according to common suggested significance thresholds we find in the literature. Now, suggested significance thresholds are common ways of referring to findings in genetic analysis studies when you don't have SNPs that reach true genome-wide significance. This is a phenomenon in genome-wide association literature because in uh, genetic analyses, the, P the, the threshold for what is considered to be truly statistically significant is not 0 0.05, but instead it is 5 to the negative 8th. So they have adopted very strict thresholds for what is considered to be a true 
association between an individual genetic marker and some trait that is being studied. Um, it's very rare that a genome-wide association study will find a true, um, a truly significant result according to p-value. So often people will talk about the results in terms of suggested significance, where they will instead discuss uh, the handful of SNPs that don't quite reach strict genome-wide significance, but instead are deemed very significant, having p-values of 5 to the negative 7th, 5 to the negative 6th, etc. We adopted these common suggestive, suggested significance thresholds to apply filters that created sparse representations of the whole genomes. In other words, they did not create representations of the genome that were biased towards any particular location along the genome, but also reduced the dimensionality. So by applying these suggested significance thresholds for gray matter and white matter separately, and then taking the union of the SNPs that are selected from both uh, imaging indicator types, <clears throat> we reduce the dimensionality from 90,000 SNPs to just over 6,000. Now, finally, um, to cap it all off, the final stage of this pipeline is the most interesting one. It is the data modeling stage, and it consists of two stages. First is the endophenotype modeling stage, which uh, applies the elastic net to identify imaging endophenotypes, which corresponds to each of our academic skill outcomes. <clears throat> the selected endophenotypes that represent or are strongly associated with each individual outcome are then used as inputs or are then used in the next stage where we perform SNP modeling, where our elastic net model is the relationship between the individual SNPs that were selected by our data engineering step and the imaging endophenotypes that correspond to each academic skill. So the outcome of stage two is um, a list of SNPs that are strongly associated with these groups of imaging endophenotypes that correspond to a relevant academic skill outcome. So some of the results of our endophenotype selection stage, um, now we're moving out of just <clears throat> describing methodology and into the actual results of our study. I have um, a table on the right here shows model R squared by type of imaging modality for each academic cognitive skill. Uh, some things to note about this table is that a zero R squared indicates that no endophenotype was selected for the corresponding skill. And the second thing to note is that these R squareds are indeed quite small, but this is not unexpectedly so. Uh, we find that gray matter regions are strongly associated with reading skills. Uh, in fact, blending words, non-word repetition, the phonological reasoning construct yielded the largest number of imaging endophenotypes that corresponded to these outcomes. And for gray matter, interestingly, there was no association with math skills at all. On the other hand, um, white matter regions seemed to be very strongly associated with math skills and that the numerical operations and numerical reasoning outcomes yielded the largest number of endophenotype associations. There was scattered association with reading outcomes, and overall, there seemed to be fewer associations between uh, white matter uh, imaging indicators in any academic outcome than in gray matter. So then we took the endophenotypes that represent each of these outcomes, and then tried to model their development using the elastic net with um, genetic variants as inputs. We have the results of these models here on the right by model R squared for uh, by type of imaging modality for each uh, academic cognitive skill, as you saw before. We found that there were no genetic associations with white matter, but there were strong gray matter associations for five of our assessments, all of which corresponded to different reading skills. We found that the SNPs that were flagged as associated with the endophenotypes representing word-level reading, elision, non-word repetition, 
and then our two principal components, which represent reading-related skills. <clears throat> 35 unique SNPs were flagged, and 20 of them were overlapped with a gene. Now, typically in genome-wide association studies, if anyone finds a individual genetic variant to be highly associated or significantly associated with some trait, they'll then go back and they'll identify all SNPs in their data set, which are highly correlated with their SNP hits. As this in, uh, high correlation in genetic data indicates that these two genetic markers were likely inherited together. So after we undo our multicollinearity filtering step, we identified 57 total SNPs that were either directly hit or were linked with a SNP hit that were also overlapped with a gene. Then using um, common gene annotation tools, we annotate the genes for their function, and we focus only on genes that have some kind of protein coding function, which means that the results of this gene are a protein in the body which has some demonstrable effect. After all of this analysis, we find that we have 24 coding genes that were related to reading. So <clears throat> since this is sort of a novel method, we wanted to look at our outcomes and check them with what we find in previous literature to sort of like give a sanity check to our results. We wanted to see if the results that we found uh, sort of corroborate what others have found in the literature. So to do so, we used the GWAS catalog, which is an NIH sponsored and curated catalog, which tracks genetic associations with different traits from large scale GWAS in the literature. So we found that we could group our findings into three categories. The most interesting one being genes that were previously associated with relevant academic scale outcomes in the literature, according to the GWAS catalog. We found that there were eight genes that are previously associated with not just like one or two, but with many academic scale outcomes, like cognitive function. Uh, these genes are associated with processing speed, um, measures of IQ, math ability, broad measures of educational attainment, and the list goes on. The list isn't very long, but the list does go on. We found that in our second category, we've identified a number of genes that were, at least according to the GWAS catalog, not necessarily uh, directly associated with any academic skill-related outcomes, but were instead primarily associated with uh, broad physiological traits. So these genes were predominantly like very broadly associated with a number of traits that are associated with uh, metabolism or immune response, for example. And then our third category were a list of genes that had little or no association with really any trait in the literature one way or the other. So this is our big takeaways from this are that first, our analytical strategy is picking up on hits that agree with past genome-wide association studies, but also is perhaps picking up on novel associations between these genes and then um, academic skill outcomes that aren't very well explored in the literature at all. But we are not quite finished with this arm of the analysis. We are sort, sort of like actively diving into our findings to really um, make sense of them. And part of that is to identify the genes that overlap with specifically reading-related genes. Now, our research group has been curating a list of genes that are associated with either reading ability or, more specifically, reading disorder over the past 30 years. And so this includes uh, genome-wide association studies that might be present in the GWAS catalog, but also consists of small like candidate gene studies or twin studies that don't fit GWAS catalog's uh, inclusion criteria. So we checked the SNPs, or we checked the individual genes that we identified with this curated list of reading-related genes, and we found that there is notable overlap between the two. I've highlighted the overlaps in red here. Um, Two things to note is that we do have some direct overlap in genes that have been previously linked with reading ability, and that uh, PCDH15 is a gene that exists in both of our lists. But more interesting, I think, 
are that we don't have direct overlap, but we have considerable gene family overlap. So for example, um, all of the genes that are highlighted in red represent a gene family that is present in both lists, despite the fact that the specific gene is not, um, like the specific gene that we find, it might not be represented in the reading list. For example, CTNNA2 is a gene that we identified to be associated with academic skill outcomes, or that we identified as associated with reading ability, but in this curated list, CTNNA1 was present. This is interesting because gene families all like they're very likely to have similar functions um and therefore could also be related to reading ability but this as i mentioned before is sort of actively under investigation and is out of my expertise a bit and this is part of the part of the um line of analysis that we start to bring in our um genetics experts to help like make heads or tails of these results for me, I was more excited by the fact that we have developed this analytical strategy that identifies genes, both from a curated list of specific reading-related genes, but also from large-scale genome-wide association studies, indicating there is some um, reliability or validity to the results. So to summarize, I think I'm a little bit over the time that I was supposed to go, but like my main... Um, points that I wanted to highlight is like my contributions to this research were experimental analysis on a novel data set that uses um, a very data-driven analytical pipeline. I'm very interested in using data to make decisions rather than um, some other mechanism. So we, we constructed this pipeline that's based on leading methods from the literature. Um, this pipeline is in my view, a blueprint for future research on similar brain imaging genetic data sets because it tries to use data as a guide for all decisions that one might make. And according to our admittedly um, incomplete but model validation methods, it seems that we are replicating previous genetic associations with various academic achievement indicators um, and some potentially novel genetic associations with reading ability, but we are still um, fully exploring this. So with that, I'll before we open it to questions or anything else, I wanted to make some acknowledgements to my team and the team at the University of Connecticut. <clears throat> Doctors Nalmova and Brankova are our physiologists and geneticists to extract all of the data. We have our team of brain imaging experts who handled all of the pre-processing and um, gave us recommendations for how to properly analyze the imaging in information. Um, Kelly Mahaffey, Martina Villa, and then Dr. Nabeen Koirala are graduate students and then postdocs at the University of Connecticut. And then clinical psychologists in our lab and uh, Jessica Garcia, Shira Matic, and then um, my PI, Elena Grigorenko, who were helping to contextualize the academic constructs that we captured via principal components. Uh, but with that, uh, I really appreciate everyone's time, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. All right, so we can open up the floor to any questions anyone has. Um, does anyone have anything specific they want to ask? So, um, Generally, it's assumed that both environment and genetics play a role in co uh, capabilities of students. Uh, have you any way of assessing uh, perhaps some environmental factors, perhaps an economic assessment of the region in which the child came from or something like that? That is a great question. In this arm of the analysis, we tried to focus only on the genetic component. Like we're sort of operating on, like we know that there is a significant amount of heritability in these skills, like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the nature part or the nurture part of the nature and nurture. Um, so we wanted to try to really interrogate what those genetic components might be and explain like that side of the picture rather than also incorporating the uh, environmental aspect. But that is just this arm of the analysis. And um, we have other members of our research team who are exploring like the socioeconomic um, 
environment in which these kids come from, looking at demographic variables. Um, I have this just as a supplemental uh, slide. Like there are uh, mostly from the University of Connecticut, we have people who are examining the relationship between how race and ethnicity might be contributing to these academic outcomes. Um, you can see we have a very uh, <clears throat> diverse group of kids, uh, which is, I think, I don't want to speak too broadly on this because it's it's been a while since I looked at our numbers, but it looks like this is fairly, this sample that we have is a little bit more diverse than say uh, the demographic profile of the United States in general. So it's notable for us, at least in like psychological research, because most of the analysis tends to be done on like very white populations. So mm -hmm. it's we're trying to, well, because it's from all the kids are collected from inner city, like New York City. Um, that's just a very interesting aspect of this data that I think our teams are exploring. I feel like I sort of answered your question. I hope that I <laughs> that touched at it. Well, it touched at it, um, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Naidu, you have a question? Yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, let me thank uh, for a very um, interesting presentation. It's a very new area of research. And uh, it's also controversial because people say that genetics, linking genetics with many of the traits is sort of, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, like um, it's a nature and nurture question. Uh, but mm -hmm. just to add to Janet's question, uh, I was wondering whether uh, there is any potential for future research uh, to find out uh, the learning style linkage with genetics, because uh, that's a very interesting topic in which uh, I have been working for some time, mm. uh, because the students are of different learning styles. We know that there are distinct, four distinct learning styles, some learn by observation, some learn by practically doing, and uh, some uh, learn by mentoring and so on and so forth. So uh, my question is that whether there's any future plans or any potential to extend the research for relating learning style to uh, genetics, because that will be very useful because mm -hmm. uh, we may be using a wrong learning mm -hmm. style as educator or even parenting. And um, it, it's, it's, I believe that it's going to be very useful. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. I yeah, there are like I my I don't know what my PI's goals are, and I'm not really in the conversations from the Child Mind Institute for what their goals are. Um, but most of the conversations in the literature sent, tend to be around, um, at least specifically for reading disability, which is uh, what my lab seems to be most interested in, uh, reading ability and reading disability in in particular. Um, to properly diagnose somebody with a reading disorder takes a lot of time and it requires like tracking the student's progress over a period of months and then um, assessing their performance in like a number of different domains. And one of the criticisms of this approach is that oftentimes once a child like might receive an appropriate diagnosis that says like, oh, you actually do have a reading disorder. We can like, now that we know this, we can provide some specialized like education that is more suited to the way that you learn. Like once they finally get to that solution, oftentimes like the child's, um, how do I phrase it? The way that they view themselves and the way that they view their relationship to reading or like academics, they've already sort of formed this opinion about themselves in their mind, which, you know, they're telling themselves like, oh, well, I'm not good at school. I don't like school. I can't do this. Um, like a lot of people are trying to like at least the hopes with this kind of analysis is that, you know, if we can identify some sort of like genetic risk variable that puts somebody at risk for a learning disorder then we can identify a person's um, potential for a learning or a reading disorder specifically, but a learning disorder in, gener in general, and then more quickly put them in some sort of like specialized educational track in order to just really make sure that there is no dip in their like, um, 
how do you say, in their performance, I guess, and their like educational trajectory. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, partly it answers, but I'm still curious to um, see whether learning style has anything to do with what you call as learning disability. <clears throat> Because if uh, we are using a wrong learning style or teaching style, maybe it may look like a disability, but actually it is not. So <laughs> that was my point. So anyway, like uh, we can discuss offline about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm afraid of answering everyone's questions only partly. <laughs> Feel free to like press me. <laughs> All right, further questions. I missed how old these children are. How how old are they? They, I'm glad you asked. Um, on average, they're about 10 years old, uh, though we do have a considerable um, like long tail there. Mm. But it's between 5 and 21, with the large majority of them being about 10. Is it generally assumed that the ratio of gray matter to white matter is stable as the child gets older? That is a great question. I don't actually know. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I don't actually know the answer to this. I mean, it would make a difference, I would mm. think. I know I, I'm trying to remember some conversations with our collaborators. I know that this has been like an issue that they think about whenever they are processing this data. Um, the particular atlases they use, I think, are pediatric atlases. So there is like a, at least in some form, they are trying to get at this idea that there is a difference between like an adult brain and a child's brain in terms of mm -hmm. development. But in terms of the specific differences between white matter and gray matter, I'm not sure at what age that the ratio becomes more or less set in stone. I believe it's quite young in terms mm -hmm. of the ratio, but in terms of like full development of like gray matter regions, oh. I'm not quite sure. Thank you. Further questions for Connor? Okay. Um, if we don't have any further questions, uh, we could probably just uh, stop the recording. Thank you guys so much for coming out and listening to this talk. Uh, we will be uploading this to our YouTube page uh, fairly soon.